Would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10? We're reading just a short paragraph this morning. Hebrews 10. Starting at verse 11. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we come to your wonderful word, and particularly this passage, which is so dense with comfort and blessing and exaltation of our Savior. And frankly, I'm not up to preaching it, and probably we really need a lot of help to even hear it. Thank you for the Spirit of God, and may he be moving among us to kind of, as it were, run his finger under the text as we study together. Take what I've prepared, but go beyond it as only you can. And we uh, commit it to you for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So it's my habit to read the scripture through every year. Sometimes I make it and sometimes I don't. Usually my wife and I read together, but I probably read Hebrews a bunch of times. And yet a few years ago, something was different. By the time I came to chapter 10... And verse 14, in particular, it felt like a piano was dropped on my head. I mean, I just could not get my mind around what verse 14 seemed to be saying. I couldn't understand it. I read it over and over again. I began to pray through it. I, I tried to memorize it. I, I studied um, in some depth. And then, you know, eventually this turned into um, a study of Hebrews for our church that spanned several years. And so I, uh, I love this text, and I wanted to share it with you this morning since, you know, on a one-shot deal, you really want to get uh, one of your favorite passages out there. So if we could summarize these few verses in a long, complicated sentence, it might read this way, big idea, Christ's sacrifice for sinners is supreme because of its contrasts its effectiveness and because of the revelation of his character. And I hope to explore that with you under three headings. First, contrast, then conclusion, character, and I hope to wind up, God willing, with some challenges for you. So um, let's start with contrast and um, I'm now in Ezekiel, so let's go back. Let's read verses 11 and 12 again. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices for sins, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. The whole book of Hebrews is a book of contrast. Its intent is to show the superiority and greatness of our Savior. And so, beginning from chapter 1, all through the book, there are these contrasts, you know, contrasts with Old Testament prophets, contrasts with the angels. How much greater is the Lord Jesus Christ than the angels, even than Moses? Um, and here, Old Testament prophets, this becomes a contrast uh, frequently seen in these verses. Um, and you know that verse 11 starts with and, so... It tells us we're continuing a discussion, a theme, and really the theme is what I just said, the superiority of Jesus over Old Testament prophets and over everything. So let me just point out, kind of as a way to introduce this text, some of the contrasts that you see. Um, one would be a contrast in number. The Old Testament priests versus the Lord Jesus. Every priest, verse 11 says, stands daily. Now, the um, Judaism of, of ancient times had 24 orders of priests, and there were many priests in, in each order. So there were a lot of them. 
It was an hereditary office in the sense that it was passed down from father to son, but there were still qualifications to be a priest, supposed to be a godly man. Um, all earthly priests have a liability going into their priesthood, and that is that we're all sinners. And these priests uh, started you know, behind the line, you might say. They had a handicap. The handicap was that they had to atone for their own sins. And so there's the multitude of, of priests in, in ancient times. And so, you know, you might think, well, and I don't go to a priest. I'm not Roman Catholic. I, uh, in fact, I don't go to church that often. I'm just fine. Um, God and me, we got our own thing, you know. So can you see that you are acting as your own priest? So the priest's job is to intercede and to make peace between holy God and sinful man, right? And so when you say to yourself, well, I got this, you know, God might be a little bit mad at me from time to time, but um, I'll take care of that. And now I'll, I'll turn over a new leaf. My wife's been trying to get me to go to church. I got a church, you know, more than twice a year. I'll, I'll just start coming once in a while. Maybe I'll uh, give a donation. Now, you don't think of it that way, but in effect, these are the sacrifices you're bringing to try to atone for what God might have against you. Um, and the hint in the text, uh, it doesn't work. Um, now, the contrast is every priest stands daily at his service, verse 12, but when Christ... So there's one Lord Jesus Christ. He is one of a kind. He's unique. He is the God-man. He's holy God and holy man. He is uniquely qualified to be the one mediator between God and man. Um, this is a great contrast among the many priests, and you might be one of them. Now, I'm not, listen, I'm not talking about the priesthood of believers. That's a whole other topic. I'm talking about acting as your own mediator to try to make things right with God. And um, there are many, 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 many in this room probably. And the truth is there's only one mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's, that's one contrast. Amen, brother. Um, another contrast, and it might seem kind of insignificant, is posture. Look at this. Every priest stands daily. Hmm. They're standing daily. Why, why are they standing? Now, this might be a design flaw in the architecture, <laughs> the tabernacle. I mean, there's no chairs, so you can't, can't sit down. But since the author and the, um, the architect of the tabernacle and of the temple is Almighty God, it's not a mistake here. There's something of great significance and you catch it in verse 11. They're offering repeatedly the same sacrifice. Can't take away sins. You keep doing it. Your job is never done. Never. Now, you look at verse 12 again. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, what did he do? He sat down. The significance of God's son sitting at his right hand following his mission on this planet cannot be overstated. Over and over again, I jotted a few verses down, I, I, uh, not exhaustively, but I mean, just listen how the Bible emphasizes Christ's ascension into heaven and what we call his session. He see, he's seated at the right hand. Ephesians 1.20, he raised him from the dead. Seated him at his right hand. Colossians 3.1, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Hebrews 1.3, Hebrews uses this phrase a lot. In 1.3, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Chapter 8 of Hebrews, the first verse, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. The verse we're looking at today in chapter 10, chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 2. I bet you have this memorized, some of you. Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And when the Gospels, at least the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, describe the return of our Lord, 
they use this phrase identically in all three. Uh, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. Matthew 26, 64, Mark 14, 62, and Luke 22, 69. So, I mean, it is a, a miracle that we're looking at and one that we uh, might take for granted. Jesus sat down because it's a done deal. He did it. He completed his mesh, mission. Mission accomplished. What he intended to come to do, he did. Meanwhile, if you had a split screen, you'd see the poor Old Testament prophets doing their thing over and over. The blood ran in the tabernacle, in the temple. And I'm told that, you know, in, in Jesus' day, in the first century temple, there was a unique, uh, complicated plumbing system to drain off at Passover time the, the volume of blood that was shed. Okay, so there's a little contrast there. Uh, let me make one more contrast. It's, it's kind of obvious. Um, the um, number and efficacy of the sacrifices. We've already seen this, but see, there's like one thought here, and it's repeated over and over again. We'll see it repeatedly in every verse, but I, you know, preachers break things up into little you know, segments that's easier to communicate, we think, and maybe to understand, but really it's one deal that we're talking about, the supremacy of our Jesus. But um, you can't miss every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly. Every religious system that says, um, you know, if you do these five things, if you bow down toward in this direction every day, if you say a certain prayer, if there is uh, a, a certain way that you're supposed to uh, restrict your lifestyle, if you do these things, you might have a chance to be right with Almighty God. There's never any assurance. So the offerings are given repeatedly, over and over again. And there are some of our brothers, unfortunately, I, I think you'd call them brothers and sisters, in denominations that are so poorly taught about this matter that they think they... It, I mean, they think that if they were to die without confessing their last sin, without doing their last right or whatever, that they would be going to hell. And the wonderful contrast is the single offering. I mean, that is a mind-blowing thing. A single sacrifice for sins, and then he sat down because it was done. So there's great contrast between uh, human priests in the one Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me um, talk now about conclusion. You know, I realize that when you hear a preacher say conclusion, you may be getting a little excited. You think that, oh, man, he's finally going to wind this thing up. No, I just use that word because it started with a C. I was trying to figure out something for effectiveness or efficacy, but, you know, it's an affliction some of us have this... Uh, alliteration thing. So anyway, conclusion simply means to me, Christ's sacrifice is supreme because it accomplished what it set out to do. Um, so we've already pointed out in these opening verses how the other um, system of uh, religion, and it, it applies to everything but biblical Christianity, uh, has all these sacrifices that can never take away sins, and it's stated very clearly in verses 12 and 13 when Christ had offered, I don't think we can read it enough, for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting for that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. Okay, so what was it that he accomplished? What was this conclusion to his single sacrifice for sins? Verse 14 gives us Two, one very obvious and one uh, less obvious uh, impacts of, of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. So verse 14 says, for by a single offering, and the writer to the Hebrews wants to emphasize that. He wants us to hear it over and over again. He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. He has perfected. That's something he did. And the idea of perfected is emphasized in three ways in this text. 
One is by the original meaning of the word perfected. It actually means to reach an intended conclusion. So without defining it yet, we have to say that whatever it was, in its very definition, in the original language, it meant to reach a conclusion for those who trust in Christ. Furthermore, the word perfected, and I, you know, sometimes I get, I think it's tedious for you all to hear people talk about Greek and Hebrew and stuff. It, sometimes it's just an exercise in, hey, I study. Um, but sometimes it can be really important, and I think this is the case here, because the tense of this word perfected is, means an action that is completed in past time, but has ongoing results. The action is not continuing, it was completed, but it continues onward. So in other words, whatever perfection is, it's actually perfect and it doesn't stop. It doesn't have to be repeated. You don't have to go again. Now, another way that this is emphasized is in the phrase that follows, he has perfected for all time. A lot of the uh, other versions like NIV, New King James, King James, uh, New Living, you may not consider that a version, but in any case, use the word forever. Literally, it means it stretches on. Um, and forever is a good way of expressing it. So this perfection, by the, the graphic nature of the verb itself, by its definition and by what is actually said, immediately following says, Made perfect forever, unchangeable. And what exactly is that? Well, he says, the ones who are made perfect are those who are being sanctified. So this is restricted not to all of humanity. Now, to be perfect, I mean, do you think of being perfect as if you're bald getting your hair back? You know, that'd be, that'd be a perfecting thing right there. Um, and, you know, this is a good-looking congregation. I can't see you in the upper decks as well, but down here, really good-looking people, but not perfect. Not perfect. It's funny how this word can goof people up. I, my wife um, had a wonderful, godly grandmother um, that I happened to meet right after we became engaged, and she was so intimidating, I just almost thought twice about the, the engagement, I mean, Grandma Linville. Um, she had memorized the entire Old Testament, our entire New Testament, most of the Old Testament. And the first time I met her, she said, hey, sit down here, and I'll, uh, I'd like to recite the Gospel of John to you. And I went, oh my gosh. Because I was a new Christian, I thought the Gospel of John I knew was long. Well, in any case, it turned out to be 1 John, thank God. So, But I'm just saying, this, this, this lady was a wonderful lady. But she, her theology was kind of messed up, and she claimed, and there are whole denominations who claim that you reach perfection in this life, meaning you don't sin. And I'll tell you what, if you hang out with those folks a little bit, you conclude, nah, they're not perfect. <laughs> it's obvious they're not perfect. So this is not talking about our daily walk and the ups and downs of our, our spiritual uh, journey. It's talking about what we would call in Romans and other places, justification. It means that there has been a legal declaration by God, the judge of the whole earth. And he has looked at his own and said, not just not guilty, that would just bring you to zero, you know, but... Uh, innocent, perfect. All the things that you've ever done, all the sin and the guilt that you have incurred over the course of your life were loaded upon Jesus. He stood in. We call that substitutionary atonement. He took your place. And God in His grace reckoned, imputed your sins to Him and His righteousness, His perfect record of obedience under the law of God to you. So God is the one who is the judge, right? So perfected means he looks at you and you think to yourself, I got all these flaws and I'm still working on, I have a, the Puritans called it a darling sin. I still got a darling sin. 
I, I, I'm trying to mortify. But he looks at you with the judgment that he imposed uh, because of Christ's righteousness, and he says you're perfect. Now, I mean, is that unbelievable? Isn't that the greatest news? And it seems like it's almost counterintuitive because you know that you're still walking uh, and stumbling and picking yourself up, and there are seasons in your life where you feel like, man, would a Christian do this? You know, and then... Um, then you're, you know, I, I used to diagram it this way. If you think about perfection as a line up here, and here you are as a sinner, and me, and all the rest of us, and when Christ uh, did what he did, and we uh, trust him wholly uh, as our only hope and savior and intercessor, immediately the, the graph of our life goes straight up and it remains there forever. That's his judgment, that's justification. But there's another blessing, the other impact of what Christ did is implied, well, I think you could say it's actually stated in the phrase that ends verse 14. Um, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. This is another action of our great God to save us. And if you were to diagram this one, you've got perfection here, and this is the legal declaration, which will sometime be rea reality called glorification. But here you are, and you're a new Christian, and this is the way your life looks. It goes up and down, looks like the stock market or something. Sometimes it's way down there, and it, it kind of <laughs> plateaus for a little while. But ultimately, the motion is upward and one day. So what God in his grace did because of the sacrifice, the single sacrifice for sins that Jesus did, is he began a work in us that he'll not stop, that continues. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ, Paul reports in Philippians 1.6. He'll keep doing it until you bear the image of Jesus. To mess this up, to confuse, to turn them around, or to blend them, justification and sanctification uh, is, is a disastrous mind game that people play with themselves. Sanctification at root, the word the, that it springs from is the word holy. So God is making you, he's holifying you all along the way. And um, I mean, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that just, isn't our Jesus so great? Um, well, I want to talk more about him now, and that would be under the point of character. And my explanation for that word is simply Christ's sacrifice is supreme because of what it reveals about the infinite preciousness and, and beauty of our Lord and Savior in his death, life, death, and resurrection. Um, the Old Testament image that uh, Isaiah 33, 17 gives us, the king and his beauty. We'll look upon the king and his beauty. So you're going to see the, the, our beautiful Christ in verse 14, if we think about it a little bit. So verse 14 forget, forces us to think about our sin. And in our world today, and I think human beings are predisposed to be able to uh, justify their sins. It's not, not really a big deal. Yeah, you know, who cares? It's a free country. I can do whatever I want. It didn't hurt anybody. So we think that way, even to the point the devilish... Uh, mindset of today's culture is to say that what we would consider right is actually wrong and, and what the Holy Word of God says is wrong is now the standard of what's right. And it's my truth, but unfortunately the folks who say my truth want to make it your truth too. Um, that's the world we live in, but that's not the world of the Bible. Jesus said, Matthew 5:48. You must be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. So that kind of disqualifies us from the get-go. 
And to reinforce that, and operating with that understanding, James wrote, brother of the Lord, um, if you uh, keep the commandments in every point except for one, you're guilty, you are accountable, I think is the way the ESV puts it. That's James uh, 2.10. James 2.10. I didn't quote it, I mashed it up. You therefore must be perfect is Matthew 5.48, James 2.10, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Well, that's not fair. Well, who gets to decide who's fair? What's fair? Almighty God does. We're operating like we're our own gods. It's not going to work that way. It can never take away sins, that mindset. We've got to rethink this deal if we're going to be right with God. And the truth is our sins are... Um, are very personal to God. Habakkuk 1.13 says that he is of purer eyes than to look upon sin. I mean, he's grossed out. He is offended. His holy character demands that he can't even stand the affront of it. The holy, holy, holy God. And you and I say, not a big deal. Well, it is a big deal. I think you have to sort of delve into what sin really is before you can understand what this verse, at least that's the path I've tried to take. So, so if, if this is true, if the word of God is true, then I got to thinking, what if we could somehow quantify all the sins of God's elect throughout time? I mean, that sounds crazy, but, but hello, I, maybe I am crazy, but what about all the Old Testament saints? We're not talking about the world in general, the, the folks that uh, have not come to Jesus and who, who will resist him to the end. We're not talking about them. We're talking about God's elect. So what if we could somehow um, quantify the height and depth and breadth of all the sins of all of God's people for all time, the, the gross and debauched mass of it, full of uh, superating, uh, stinking, sin, transgression, iniquity, every commandment of God, broken myriads of times by every one of God's people. It, it's, it's become a, a, a sore on the creation. It's so large. It's a Jupiter-sized mass. It's the death star of our sins. Your sins are there, mine are too. And it is unbelievably, immeasurably wicked and terrible. And see, what this verse is saying, if I can read it plainly, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. He, by a single offering. By a single offering, he has perfected. And I guess I'm a visual learner or thinker, or something, and uh, so I, I, in my mind, I think about this, this, this spheroid, this giant, glacially large mass of sin, and then I think what the verse says is that you add, and I actually put this on a PowerPoint slide one time, you add this little dot, this little red dot, the blood of Christ. Here you've got, fills, it fills our imagination, fills the sky, it's so huge. And I think that's actually true, even though we're not going to see it that way necessarily. But here you add to that, for by a single offering, and the end result of that single offering is that this huge, stinking mass that grosses God's God out, that is an affront to his holiness, is wiped clean. And I, I thought to myself, how can that be? How could it? How, we just got through talking about how all the continual sins, uh, sorry, sacrifices, offerings by human priests really didn't work at all. So how is it this one little red dot wipes this all out? Now, I hope you see the error of my visualization. It's true that our sin, and if you could 
roll them all together, you'd have this horrible thing. But my, my problem was in characterizing Jesus' sacrifice as this little dot. Because if we were really honest, what we would say is that though our sin is egregious and terrible and sends us to hell, it's like this. It's a tiny pinprick compared to the beauty and efficacy and perfections of our Jesus. And you'd have to roll out a spheroid, if you wanted to keep thinking about it this way, that was infinitely larger than the death star of sin, and it swallows it up. And why is that? It's because of Jesus, the God-man. There's no one like him. There, he is perfect in all his ways. He's the king in his beauty. All his perfections demand our worship joyfully. He's the kindest person you'll ever know. He is the holiest, most perfect man that you could ever conceive of. He is our redeemer, the one who stood in for us, who loved us even though we were unlovable and didn't have any desire to be his. He brought us to himself before the ages began. Isn't that amazing of our Christ? So, you know, that's why verse 14 says what it says by a single offering. He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. I mean, that's why the gospel that we, that we love and that we believe assures us that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. When Peter was thought, talking about our, the change in Christians' lives in 1 Peter 1, he said, you were redeemed not by perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. It's precious. I mean, you ought to do a word study on precious, not used very often. Um, our Jesus is precious. His sacrifice is precious. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I resonate with the song of Revelation 5. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's what Jesus did. And it is in a perfect tense. It is, he did that, and the results are eternal. And we never have to revisit this issue again, even though your sin troubles you a great deal. So let me finish up with just some challenges. You know, the Word of God challenges us. And we think wrongly sometimes. Probably every person in this room has got the wrong idea about something related to our faith and to the Bible. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, some of it is trivial, and you may have the exact number of angels that can dance on the head of a pin, but, um, you know, if I have a different number, that's probably not a big deal. But if we get this wrong, if we get the, the truth of Christ wrong, then we have made a fatal and eternal error. So let me give you some challenges that this, this uh, text might bring to help us think rightly and to respond rightly. One challenge would be to someone here who might think, you know, I don't mind coming to church sometimes, but this Jesus stuff, this, this kind of uh, single-minded Jesus stuff, I, I don't know, I don't think I really need that. I think I'm okay. I mean, I'm a good person. I'm not like uh, the serial killer or the, uh, you know, the guy they're holding up there in northern Idaho that maybe killed those college students. I, I would never do anything like that. I'm a pretty good guy. <coughs> to which I would say to you, according to this text, the only way for a sinner like you or me to be right with God is God had to kill his own son. So you should challenge your thinking and turn to Christ. Now another challenge, um, I don't know if there are any prideful Christians in reality. Do you think there are? But if you are one, if you have pride, and sometimes, I mean, you would never voice it, but you think, eh, I'm, a, I'm so glad I'm so much better than a lot of people because, man, um, same deal with the serial killer thing. I didn't do that. I, 
You should see my brother-in-law, you might say to yourself. You know, that guy's a mess. Compared to me, well, uh, that may not apply to you at all. You may be tops in humility, uh, <laughs> if that's a thing. But I want to challenge you if pride sometimes steals in as if Jesus didn't have to work all that hard to get you saved. I mean, it was like you were good and all you needed was a little Jesus. Listen, friends, this truth says that your sin qualifies you for heaven qualifies you for hell. Please, if this is being taped, can you somehow edit that out? I was with you up until you said. <laughs> um, I was journaling one day. Uh, usually at night I journal. I sometimes write out a prayer about my sin. And I ask God's forgiveness, and I, I was writing this out. Dear Lord, forgive me for, I'm not going to tell you what it was uh, for this. And, and then it was like with a flash of insight, I wrote, which qualifies me for hell. And I realize that this slight sin, you might say, is enough to send me to hell, James 2.10 says. So the truth here challenges us to humility and repentance and ultimately to worship, to lift up Jesus, um, and to evangelism. A third challenge if there's anyone, and I know there are people just like this, because I tend to be this way myself, uh, anyone who feels like your sin is so terrible that how could God ever, ever love you and ever take you as his own? I mean, doesn't he look, you just said, he, uh, Habakkuk 1.13, he can't even look at you. Well, I'm talking to Christians now, and I think that sometimes we feel like I have this same stupid sin that keeps reoccurring and I'm having real trouble with it. And doesn't God just finally go, come on, I'm, gonna, I'm done with you. I'm, I'm done, okay? Go take your life elsewhere. Now, I understand that. You have a tender conscience. It's good to be grieved by your sin, but look at this text. I mean, you hadn't done anything good or bad when he chose you. you. You weren't qualified for heaven, and you never would be. It's th the problem we get by introspection too much is that we fail to see our Savior. We look at our sin and say, oh, it's black, it's horrible. Ah, God condemns it. Look at your Jesus, high and lifted up, seated at the right hand of God. Look at what he did by a single offering. He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Rejoice, brothers and sisters. Our righteousness didn't bring us to Christ and it won't keep us in Christ. It's Jesus who does that. Um, I think that my last challenge, number four here, is, is uh, kind of similar. You ever feel like, are there people here who so, sort of feel like, you know, back in the day I was close with the Lord and I, I had a vibrant prayer life, and the Lord was using me, obviously, but I'm, I don't know what happened, but I just don't feel his presence anymore. I don't get any zing out of reading the Bible. It's just, I, I get, you know, I'm going to heaven, but I just don't really feel like much is going on, and that God has kind of put me aside. You ever feel that way? Have you ever felt that way? Listen, do you see what he said in for by a single offering is perfected for all time. Those who are being sanctified. This is another verb tense. It's not perfect. It's present. It's ongoing action. The action was completed in perfection. It's ongoing action by Almighty God in your life. When the Holy Spirit took up residence in your life, He's not given up. He's there. Repent. Turn to Him. Get on your knees. Start praying again. Ask him to show you how to serve him. Give me a heart of worship, O Lord. Worship is the antidote for so much because your eyes are upon him and you begin to see the glory of our king. All right, well, let me close by, I want to read a, a quote from Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon. Finally, brethren, 
It remains for us to recollect that Christ will be one of two things to every one of us here present. Either we shall see him at the right hand of God and rejoice that he is lifted so high, or else we shall behold him there with horror as we writhe beneath his feet. For his people, perfected forever, it is their heaven to think that Christ is highly exalted. Oh, would we not exalt him if we could? Is there anything in this world that we would keep back from him? Is there any suffering from which we would shrink if we would lift him high? I hope I can speak for all of God's people and say the dearest object of our life is to honor him. Oh, for high thrones for Jesus and bright crowns for Jesus. Let him be crowned with majesty who bowed his head to death by all things that have breath. Let him have the highest place that heaven can yield him. Let's pray. And our Lord, we could never, we don't have the vocabulary or the strength to offer you the, the thanks that you deserve for what you've done in our lives. For this supreme sacrifice that was entirely voluntary, Nobody twisted your arm to do this. You came, the God of all creation, and you took upon human flesh and did this for us, for by a single offering. You have perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So, Lord, encourage us with this truth. Help us not to be discouraged in our walk but to turn again to you again and again and to thank you for what is a done deal, what is a finished mission. And thank you for the ongoing work of grace that you're doing through the means of grace and by the Spirit of God. May we honor you, honor you this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.